Hello everyone, uh, good morning for those that are in Europe, good afternoon for those that are in uh, in Japan, it's 5 p.m. In, uh, in Tokyo. Welcome to the Technology Transfer Webinar number 18, is April 27, 2018. Uh, today we're going to talk about patents and specifically opposition proceedings and nullity actions. It's going to be a little bit different from the usual webinar because as you can see we have a lot of presenters a lot of speakers and uh, specifically we will have a moderator uh, Diane uh, and two speakers uh, Robert and Sonoda San from uh, from Tokyo and Robert from Germany so I would just introduce the help desk for a minute uh, just in a nutshell give you some uh, relevant information and then give the floor to uh, to the speakers so as you can see from this slide, uh, I'm the project manager of the EU Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. If you don't know me yet, uh, and now you do, uh, this is my email, luca.escoffier.eujapan.grjp, if you have any questions, any feedback, uh, even after seeing the other website, the other website that we're managing, the database of the help desk on the website that you see just right below my email, so I really suggest you to pay a visit to the website and please do provide the feedback. Uh, we are still running, actually, it's almost closed, uh, a survey for SMEs, specifically from uh, Europe. So if, you, uh, if you're interested, please do go on the website and uh, you will be redirected. It would be helpful if you can fill it out. And uh, finally, uh, the last link is the one of the newsletter that you also find on website of the help desk so we would love to have you on board as a member of the opposition without further ado i would like to introduce to you the three uh, speakers of today starting from uh, yoshi sonoda sonoda san dr sonoda is the managing partner of sonoda and kobayashi uh, a law firm founded 20 years ago uh, yoshi san has acquired extensive knowledge in various aspects of intellectual property rights over more than 30 years and the, as the primary patent litigator, Dr. Sonoda handles appeals, invalidations, infringement proceedings for companies, public organizations from Europe and the US before Japanese courts. Dr. Sonoda regularly gives seminars abroad and at IT organizations, and as today, so, uh, for our webinar. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Robert Berner. Uh, Dr. Berner studied general physics at the Technical University of Munich and completed his PhD studies at the University of de Bruxelles in Brussels with research on chemical reactions on metal surfaces under high, uh, high vacuum. In 2001, Dr. Berner uh, started his training as a German and European patent attorney in a mid-sized Munich-based German patent firm, which he completed in 2005 by passing the German and European qualification examinations. Dr. Berner joined Mugitroid in 2011 to build up and lead the German office and was appointed director Patent and trademarks in 2013. In addition to this experience in patent prosecution litigation on various technical fields, Dr. Berner has a lot of experience in matters relating to trademarks and regularly travels to Japan. Uh, actually, last time we met uh, for a seminar here in Tokyo uh, that you can also watch on our uh, YouTube page. And uh, the times that he came here to enhance the cooperation with local clients and partners by presenting seminars about European and German patent and trademark practice. Uh, the last uh, speaker today is also uh, Jan Didier, uh, graduated from CP, the French IP Council of Qualification, and specializing in comparative IP law, providing advice on the Japanese IP system. He is very attentive to corporations' business issues. He helps clear clients streamline their internal procedures and establish the best IP practice for Japan. She joined Sonoda and Kobayashi in 2008, and she speaks French, English, Japanese, German, and some Chinese. Without further ado, now you know almost everything about today's speakers. I would give the floor to Diane to start moderating. So Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca, for the introduction. Can you hear me? We can, we can. Yes, thank you. So here's Diane from uh, Sonoda and Kobayashi. Uh, thank you for all joining this webinar today. 
So we're going to discuss the countermeasures uh, somebody can take to um, against the computer's patent. Uh, so as you may know, uh, in Japan as well as in Europe, uh, there are two uh, system possible. Uh, one is the opposition and one is the invalidation. So let's discuss these two systems and the differences between the two jurisdictions. So we're going to start with Sonodasa. Uh, Dr. Sonoda, could you please give us some uh, basic facts? about these two options in Japan. Thank you, Dion. So, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. So, when our problematic patent is granted to your competitors, there are two options you can use in Japan. One is an opposition. The second is a nullity action. And there are, in fact, other means to attack the validity of the patent, which is to counter-argue at an infringement court. But no, we are not talking about that today. And we talk only about opposition and nullity action, both at the Japan Patent Office. Sometimes I say JPO, which stands for Japan Patent Office. The first one is opposition, and very uh, briefly, this is, opposition is different from nullity action by the fact that you can file opposition only within six months from the publication of the patent. So you must do it quickly. And <clears throat> there were 1,250 oppositions filed last year. As opposed to this opposition, you can use also nullity action. And for this, there is no time limit, so any time after grant, even after a patent is expired. Last year, 161 nullity actions were filed. So in total, 1,000, about 400 the oppositions and nullity actions filed last year to challenge the validity of a patent. And this number is relatively small because last year there were over 300 patent applications filed in Japan and almost 200,000 patents granted. So the opposition and nullity actions were filed for less than 1% of Japanese granted patents. So please uh, go to the European uh, fact. Good morning and good afternoon. This is Robert Berner from Murgatroyd Munich. Um, at the situation at the European Patent Office is a bit different. We have uh, not 1% of patents opposed. In 2017, as you can see, we have uh, 100,000, uh, a bit more, uh, patents granted by the EPO. And the number of oppositions filed was about 3,900 and 3.7%. And uh, quite interestingly, um, from the patent oppositions, uh, there are, well, 27, 28, so almost a third are uh, successful, meaning that the patent has been revoked. Uh, another 40% um, are partly successful, meaning that the patent has been upheld in amended form. And uh, for the rest, the oppositions have been rejected. And um, as you know, uh, we will talk about that in detail later. There is no uh, centralized nullity action against the European patent as granted at the moment. Um, so um, being based in Germany, I go for the German nullity actions. And um, if you can see the invalidation proceedings at the Federal German Patent Court in 2016, there have been 284 filed and uh, 400 were pending at that time and there are 206 closed proceedings, either uh, by the parties coming to an agreement or by a final decision. And quite interestingly, uh, the number or the percentage in which the patent was revoked is higher. It's 43%. And um, the, the invalidation request was only rejected in uh, about 21%. And um, the reason is that maybe um, 
as we say, we'll see later in validation proceedings are more expensive, so maybe people uh, think twice about uh, starting them. Well, thank you both for uh, the introduction of the fact. So we understood that there is more opposition file in Europe compared to Japan. So now, Robert, could you please uh, tell us who is eligible to file an opposition at the European Patent Office? Yes, I will start with that. Um, according to the European Patent Convention, the opposition is open to any person. So um, quite interesting, you don't need any legal interest. So uh, that's quite important, so you don't need to be uh, sued by the patent owner in an infringement action to file an opposition. And there are some cases, uh, some years ago, a trainee training for the European patent qualification, he just filed oppositions as a training. So he had no legal interest, he just did it to, to get himself up to speed for the examination proceedings, uh, his own test before the European Patent Office. There is um, one exception, the patent owner, you're not entitled to file an opposition against your own patent, however the inventor is. There's one more restriction within the EPC, uh, the opponent needs to be identifiable. So it's not possible to file an opposition anonymously. However, um, if you want to stay anonymous, um, you have some options because you can use a third party as a straw man. And that is allowable unless you, your intent is really to circumvent the law. So even in this case, uh, it shouldn't be possible to use a straw man for a patentee. But in the end, if nobody finds out, uh, you will have no problem here. And of course, um, usually you use a straw man that is not uh, linked to your company, um, meaning that you don't use your standard uh, European representative for filing the opposition, because, uh, but usually you use another patent attorney law firm and they just uh, then file the case and hand in the statements and then, uh, but your company and your standard representative uh, stays in the background. One thing which is also interesting, if you um, start an opposition and then afterwards you sell your business or you sell uh, you, you lo the interest, somebody else is interested in the opposition, you can only transfer the status at, as, as an opponent as part of the complete opponent's business assets. So uh, that's the situation at the EPO. Uh, Yoshi-san, is that different at the JPO? Uh, very similar, uh, not exactly the same. So please let me explain the entitlement at the JPO. At the JPO also, any third party can file an opposition. Interest, legal interest is not necessary for that. So uh, if you want, you can use a straw man uh, to hide your identity. And there are some advices that we have in connection with this. And when you use a straw man to hide the identity, we recommend that you do not use the patent, Japanese patent attorney you are usually using because uh, the opponent or the patentee can guess who is behind the patent attorney. So <clears throat> that is, uh, we, are, we did very often that to find unrelated third party to file an opposition in his or her name. And uh, we... Yeah, so let's talk now about the reasons uh, that can be raised uh, to oppose the patent. Uh, please, so not one go, go, go ahead and explain us what, what are the grounds uh, at the GPO to oppose the patent. Yes, thank you, Diana. The, with regard to the grounds to raise opposition, you can raise you know, any grounds which could be used in the examination by the examiner, uh, which means a lack of novelty, of course, a lack of inventive step, a lack of support, clarity, or enablement, which is a disclosure requirement, and the introduction of new matter by amendments. You can raise this also, and double patenting, or non-patentable subject matter. 
so almost all of the reason can be raised. <clears throat> but uh, as an advice, uh, we'd like to say that an opposition is not an interpart procedure. Rather than that, uh, you should think that this is an extension of the examination. Therefore, there is no exchange of opinions with the patentee, between the patentee and the opponent. And it is very important to convince the Board of Appeals, which makes a judgment on the opposition. And uh, you should be aware that the, the Board is not bound by the reason and evidence you submit to the Board. Board might adopt uh, the reason and evidence you submit, but may not. That's a discretion of the Board. So could you, uh, Robert, explain the situation in Europe? Well, in Europe, um, the grounds for filing an opposition are laid out in Article 100 of the EPC. And uh, there are mainly three points. The first is that the subject matter of the patent is not patentable under the Articles 52 to 57 of the European Patent Convention. And these are the, let's call it, standard reasons. It's a lack of novelty or lack of inventiveness. It's excluded subject matter, like uh, software as such, or medical uh, things. Then you have a lack of industrial application. The next uh, possible ground for opposition is that it's a lack of sufficiency, meaning that the patent uh, does not disclose the invention in a way that is sufficiently clear and complete to be carried out by a person skilled in the art. As I said, that's a lack of sufficiency. It's not a lack of clarity, as I will discuss in a minute. Um, the third reason in Article 100 is that the subject matter of the application uh, of the patent extends beyond the content of the application as filed. That's the Article 1232 of the European Patent Convention. So inadmissibly broadening the original scope of disclosure. Um, Interestingly, these are the only reasons uh, or grounds for opposition which can be used at the EPO. So no ground for um, opposition is a lack of unity, a lack of clarity, a lack of support, formal issues, a wrong de inventor designation, or whether the patentee is not entitled to the patent. And these reasons, you need to uh, raise all grounds, uh, no, all grounds which you raise in your notice of opposition, you need to really substantiate them. And uh, the problem is at the EPO uh, that if you want to have new grounds for opposition, let's uh, consider a situation where you file an opposition and afterwards uh, you, you base it only on a lack of novelty and inventiveness and afterwards you find out that the claims are uh, containing subject matter which has not originally been part of the invention uh, or of the application. Um, the problem with that is at the EPO, uh, these new grounds uh, for opposition, they're only allowable if prima facie relevant. Prima facie means, so at first sight, it's clear the, reason, the grounds you try to get into the proceedings are highly relevant for the opposition for the patent to be revoked. In that case, new grounds can also be raised by the opposition division. And uh, you also have to um, consider one point here. Um, the grounds which are covered by Article 100A, meaning lack of novelty, inventiveness, on the one hand, excluded subject matter, and no industrial uh, application, these are dealt uh, as separate grounds. So if you only substantiate and raise a lack of novelty, inventiveness, and later you find out that it's a complete software patent, uh, you will, may have problems in getting that new uh, grounds allowed in the proceedings. Um, there is one exception. Um, if the claims during the opposition are amended, and if the amendments are based on the description and not only on dependent claims, then um, the whole new claim set needs to comply with all requirements of the European Patent Convention. So meaning if the uh, patentee amends his claims and in, uh, enters features from the description, you may raise new grounds 
And of course, um, you can then also raise further objections which are not mentioned in Article 100 of the EPC. So not only you can raise new grounds uh, of your position, but you can also then start clarity objections, unity objections, and uh, the, the, the opposition division needs to take them up. And our advice here is quite clear. Um, due to this um, well, limited possibility to enter new grounds, you should raise and substantiate all grounds for opposition in the notice of opposition. So if you really decide, I want to file an opposition, you should be well prepared, and you should put all your arguments and all your grounds in the first um, statement to be filed. Thank you. So with regard to the time frame of the procedure, Robert, could you uh, please give us more details on how it works in Europe? Yes, with, uh, I'm happy to do that, uh, Diane, thanks. Um, Usually, the deadline for filing an opposition is nine months from the publication of the mention of the grant of the European patent. Nine months is, in my view, um, quite sufficient if, even if you need um, to have translations uh, sent back and forward to uh, outside parties, even if you have to carry out a search. But of course, uh, that's only sufficient if you're aware of the patent. So uh, if you have a competitor who is quite active, uh, you may consider installing a patent watch on their patents, uh, the pending patents, to be in the position to decide about a possible opposition uh, in due time. Um, the overall time frame um, for the opposition proceedings, um, it's quite interesting. The, the EPO, they, in the recent months and years, they try to speed up their proceedings. And uh, they also have an initiative called the Early Certainty for Opposition. And uh, the, the aim of that initiative is they want to lower the average time until a decision is taken in the first instance to 15 months. At the moment, uh, we have a time frame of more than two years in average. So after filing your opposition, your uh, decision will be rendered uh, a bit more than two years from the filing of the opposition. Um, there is linked with this initiative a rather strict deadline regime. So uh, once you file an opposition, the EPO uh, will forward it to the patentee who's got a strict time limit to reply. And then um, the extension of, of time are only allowed in exceptional cases with the EPO. And officially, it's also planned that there will be only one round of submissions before the summons to oral proceedings. Uh, that means you have to, you file your opposition note, and uh, the patentee will then reply. Um, there is one um, point here: the the summons for oral proceedings will be issued usually with several months after you receive the reply of the patentee. So um, then, of course, you have the possibility to send another reply. But officially, the EPO t t tries to limit the time for preparation of the oral proceedings and um, to do that rather strictly. And as I said, just um, at the EPO, usually you, you have the, the uh, hearing, uh, the oral proceedings in opposition proceedings. It's um, usually the summons for the oral proceedings you re receive at least six months before the hearing takes place. A hearing will take place if either of the party requested it or if the opposition division deems it helpful for the um, yeah, proceedings as such. And with the summons, you receive usually a preliminary opinion. And in that preliminary opinion, uh, there will be the main issues um, which will have to be discussed at the oral hearing. Usually, the uh, opposition division uh, then states also at the moment, we are of the opinion that novelty over document D1 is present, but it will be discussed at the oral hearing whether inventiveness uh, in view of documents D1 and D2 is, uh, at, is present. So um, they try to focus the people's minds on the, uh, on the discussions to be made during the oral proceeding. And um, after you receive your summons, you can have uh, last statements to be filed be uh, two months before the hearing. And these statements usually um, are um, a set of claims uh, and several requests, uh, because in the European practice, you may file auxiliary requests in opposition by the patentee. And of course, there will be a, an additional 
final statement by the opponent uh, clarifying his um, final uh, points about maybe some issues raised in the reply by the patentee. Um, usually at that time um, in oral hearings, new requests or evidence is only admitted again if it's prima facie relevant. So if you sit in the oral proceedings and the other party then uh, suddenly comes with another prior art or, or you want to present a uh, further prior art document or the patentee comes with a new set of claims, um, many boards, uh, many opposition divisions will just um, reject that as being late filed. Um, at the end of the um, hearing, there will be a decision and usually the decision will be either the patent will be maintained as granted, so the uh, opposition is rejected, or the patent will be uh, maintained in amended form according to one of the requests filed by the patentee, or the patent will be revoked. And after the uh, oral proceedings, you will receive the minutes of the oral proceedings and the written decision, and that will follow within some weeks after the hearing usually. So that is a, a really rough overview about the position proceedings, uh, the time frame, and how they are structured at the uh, EPO. I think the most important to retain is you try to make your case as soon as possible, and usually you will have oral proceedings. So how's the situation back in Japan, Yoshi? The it looks like that. Now, one very important difference uh, between Europe and Japan is that uh, in the JPO, Japan Patent Office, there is no oral hearing for oppositions. And the, the, the time frame you can find an opposition is shorter, six months, and there is no oral hearing, and the decision can be expected within six months. So the opposition under the Japanese patent law is designed to be a pretty quick and simplified proceedings. Please let me show the proceedings for opposition. When the patent is granted and published, the opponent has six months to file an opposition here, and once it is filed, the opposition is, of course, transferred to the patentee. But at this moment, the patentee is not even requested to answer because this opposition is examined by the JTO, the board of three examiners. And here, the board will decide now, whether there is a real reason for revocation or not. And if the board decides that there is no revocation at all, the board will reject the opposition without any reply from the patentee. That is this, this line. But if the, there is, the board decides that there is a reason to revoke the patent, the board describes the reason and notifies the reason for revocation to the patentee here. And the patentee is requested to file a response or if he or she wants, file amendments. This is here. And when the, the response is filed, <clears throat> it, uh, what happens depends on whether the amendments are filed at the same time. If amendments are filed, this amend, these amendments are given to the opponent, and opponent can submit a secondary the, the opinion against the amended claims for the second time. If there is no amendment, the opponent is not given to submit their opinion. And then, the, examination continues and come to a decision. However, uh, that is not written here because it complicates too much the, the flow. As a result of the examination here, if the board comes to an opinion that the patent should be revoked, then the, 
the board will give the second chance to the patentee to amend the claims again and examine the amended claims. And the final decision is made. So, Sunanathan, the opposition, let's say the opposition is rejected. Can we appeal the decision to maintain the patent? So, what's the situation at the GPU? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, what you can do depends on whether the patent is invalidated or maintained. If the decision is to maintain the patent, the opponent can do nothing. It is because opponent can file a nullity action any time. Therefore, there is no direct way to appeal and challenge uh, the decision already made for opposition. However, in contrast, if the decision is to invalidate the patent, the patentee can file an appeal and in the IT High Court. And <clears throat> IT High Court might uh, in, uh, reverse the decision made by the JPO or confirm the decision. <clears throat> and in the, in the reality, uh, suppose that uh, you file an opposition and the opposition is rejected, that is the patent is maintained, it will be a little more difficult to invalidate the patent by nullity action because, no, I'm sorry, <clears throat> unless you have a brand new evidence to invalidate the patent. If the new nullity action is based on exactly the same evidence used in opposition, then the, if you file a nullity action, in order to find a different conclusion, that is to invalidate the patent by the nullity action, the JPO must find a good reason that the JPO made a mistake or was wrong in opposition. And the, now, with a new argument, JPO is making a different decision, which is very difficult to happen. Therefore, once the, you fail in opposition, you must understand that the, to invalidate a patent by nullity action has become more difficult. So could you comment the European, European situation? Well, at the EPO, we have the lucky situation that we can appeal an opposition division directly at the EPO. So uh, an appeal has to be filed within two months of the notification of the contested decision. So two months after you receive the written grounds of the um, opposition division's decision in your case, you have to file the appeal and you have to pay the appeal fee. And to be honest, it's not a very high fee um, for a large entity. It was just raised to 2,255 euros and small entities, small medium-sized enterprises, universities and private persons can get it for uh, 1,880 euros. And after you file your formal appeal, you need to file your grounds within four months of the notification. So two months after your deadline to file the formal appeal, you have to provide all your reasons why you think that the decision is not correct. Um, an appeal can only be filed if you are adversely affected by the decision. So imagine that the patent is maintained in the granted form, then of course the patentee cannot appeal that decision. The same if the patent is revoked, then the, um, well, the, the opponent cannot appeal the decision. Um, there is one quite interesting point. Um, in these proceedings, uh, there is the uh, no reformatio in payers principle. So what does it mean? It means um, if you have the patent maintained in amended form and you as opponent are the only person who appeals because you think it should be revoked completely, um, the reformatio in payos um, would mean that it would be possible for you that the patent after the appeal will be broader than it was before. 
So your position may not get better, uh, get worse in the appeal proceedings if you're the only appellant. That means if you are the opponent and the patent was maintained according to auxiliary request four, and you appeal to that, the outcome of the appeal stage can only be better for you, meaning either, either the patent is more restricted afterwards or completely revoked. Um, as with opposition, the grounds of appeal should contain a, the complete case of your party, all facts, arguments, requests, and evidence, because even more than in the opposition stage, uh, the appeal stage, later evidence and requests may be rejected by the boards of appeal. And um, in some cases, during the last years, uh, there was a tendency that some boards of appeal, they took the position, well, it's an appeal, it's not a completely new instance, we only will review the legal aspects of the first instance decision. And um, there is currently under discussion new rules of procedure for the Board of Appeals, uh, which are discussed at the Administrative Council of the European Patent uh, Convention. And that means that they will put that into a legal frame that the subject matter of the appeal is the case as it was in the first instance decision. So there will only requests filed in the first instance will be accepted. And additionally, uh, there will be no further technical discussion possible. As I said, some boards do that at the moment, whereas in some other boards, uh, you may well start the technical discussion all over again. That may change in the future. It remains to be seen. So um, that has the effect that you put, should really put forward all your um, material against the patent in the first instance already. And usually, um, again, you have one round of submissions before you receive the summons to oral proceedings, again with a preliminary opinion, which is maybe sometimes not as detailed as in the first instance. And again, this is officially. Nobody will object if you file further statements before this, uh, you receive the summons to oral proceedings. And in this case, you have a deadline for final submissions. It's one month before the hearing. And um, Another thing which may happen is that uh, the Board of Appeal, they will not decide completely about the opposition case. They can remit the case back to the um, opposition division. Imagine that you have a patent uh, and you attack it for a lack of novelty uh, with respect to document one and um, also with respect to inventiveness, with respect to documents D1 and D2. And the opposition division comes to the conclusion, yes, a lack of novelty, we revoke the patent. And it goes up to appeal, and the Board of Appeal says, no, uh, we think that the subject matter of the claims is new. Um, but we won't decide about inventiveness. We will send it back to the first instance, because they have to decide whether it's inventive. So it may happen that um, there will be a ping pong play be between the opposition division and the appeal uh, Board of Appeals. Um, until a final decision is rendered. Depends on the, um, well, which grounds have been raised and which grounds have been discussed by the first instance at, at the opposition division. The current time frame of an appeal proceedings at the EPO is three to four years. And during the last years, it even grew more because there had been problems with restaffing Board of Appeals at the European Patent Office. And, um, According to the latest changes, it's intended to decrease that uh, by increasing the productivity of the Board of Appeals. So they should render more decisions and they should render that faster. And that's maybe also the reason um, why they want only to have them review the legal aspects of the first instance decision, because of course that's faster than if they have to get into all these technical, uh, well, procedures again. Well, thank you for uh, the description. So we, we saw that there is quite a difference between Japan and Europe on the opposition system, uh, especially with regard to the, the speed of the procedures, but the oral hearing and also uh, the, um, the possibility to file on an appeal. So now that the patent is finally maintained, what are the options? Uh, Robert, could you please describe the invalidation proceedings in your jurisdictions? Yes, um, as I mentioned before, um, we have the, well, let's call it problem, that the European patent is divided into a plurality of national patents after it has been granted. 
That means that at the moment uh, we don't have any centralized invalidation proceedings because you have to file a nullity action in every country where the European patent has been validated. And um, also we in Murgatroyd cover a lot of these jurisdictions in-house. I can only refer to German uh, uh, yeah, jurisdiction. And of course, um, in Germany, well, it's, it's a very important market of high importance for all the patent owners. And um, the good thing is that if you have a nullity action in Germany, many of the smaller countries, they tend to follow the German decisions, which have a very good reputation. And um, a German national invalidation proceedings, they have uh, the format of a court action at the Federal German Patent Court. And it's not like um, opposition proceedings. It's really a court action with their own procedural rules. And it's a rather formalistic proceedings. In some cases, uh, patent owners or um, parties trying to invalidate the patent, they not only get a patent attorney um, to represent them, but also have attorney at law in these cases. Again, it's open to general public. You don't need any legal interest. And um, there is no deadline. You can file it as long as the patent is, uh, well, in force or even after it has expired. In this case, however, you need a legal interest. Um, if there is an opposition pending at the European Patent Office, you're not allowed to file a um, invalidation proceedings at the Federal German Patent Court until the opposition has been uh, terminated. That may be different in other countries. I know that, um, for example, the situation in, in France is that you need a legal interest. In Italy and uh, Ireland, they, uh, you can file the nullity proceedings before the end of the opposition, but they will stay the proceedings. Um, one point, which is, of course, due to the nationality of the proceedings, the language in, is German, um, but the language of the European patent is relevant if you have to decide about the literal meaning of terms and how a person skilled in the art would understand the terms of the patent. So, um, of course, meaning that the, the proceedings are in German, you have to consider translation costs. For example, if you're a um, Japanese opponent, you need to have translations into English mainly. So um, once you receive a counter statement filed by the patentee, which will be in German, or if you have a preliminary opinion by the court, uh, you need to translate that uh, and forward that, uh, which incurs some additional costs at that time. Um, again, um, you will have usually one round of statements. Uh, so you file your grounds in the, for invalidity and a reply by the patentee. And, uh, then usually you would already receive a preliminary opinion of the court. And that indicates the main issues which are to be discussed and setting a date for all the proceedings. And um, that um, well, scheme with a preliminary opinion of the court has only been introduced into the German nullity actions about uh, eight years ago. And the reason was for speeding up the proceedings, uh, trying to get the parties focused on the main issues uh, which have been identified by the court. Um, in preparation of the oral proceedings, you will have one more round of statements in preparation. So the patentee usually files all his requests and his additional claim sets, and uh, you may then reply to them uh, before the oral proceedings. Um, a very, very important difference uh, between a, an opposition at the EPO and a German invalidation at the Federal Patent Court are the costs. At the EPO, each party bears it, its own costs. So even if you lose, you don't have to reimburse the other party. However, at German nullity actions, um, there will be a decision on the costs uh, rendered by the court. And the losing party will have to bear the costs of the winning party. Uh, meaning that if the patent is completely revoked, the other party have to, has to imburse you uh, 100% of the costs according to the, well, um, a very, uh, a, it, they will not fully reimburse your actual costs, but there will be a limit set for the reimbursable amount. And that reimbursable amount, uh, it's depending on the value of the case. 
And um, if you have a value of the case of 750,000 euros, um, you have to consider that the court fees to be paid are around 20,000 euros. And if you lose at the first instance, you will have to pay the court fees and you have to reimburse the other party costs in the amount of uh, roughly 12,000 euros. If the other party is represented by an attorney at law, in addition to a patent attorney, it may be even possible that you have to pay the double amount to the other party. Um, so that's the main, dip, one, of, one of the real crucial differences between opposition and invalidation proceedings. And, um, and there are some other differences. Um, the possible grounds for invalidation are the same as in a European patent opposition at the EPO. However, there's one reason, uh, one additional reason, and that's the fraudulent abstraction. And I had to really, uh, well, I had to look for the correct translation. And uh, that means that the applicant is not entitled to the patent and that the real person, the person who's really entitled, then may, may file a nullity action um, because the patent owner is not entitled to the patent. That's not a reason at the EPO, but at the German patent office, uh, at the patent court, you can raise that reason. Um, the German patent court is not bound to an earlier decision of the EPO. So if the patent survived an opposition, it not necessarily means that it will also survive a uh, nullity action. Um, in many cases, of course, the EPO decision is a indication. But as I said, the court is not bound to that. Um, you can also raise the exactly same grounds as in the earlier uh, opposition. But it's also advisable, of course, to re rely on additional documents if possible. So if you come up with another patent search after your position and you find documents which are novelty destroying, you can, of course, use them at the nullity proceedings. It's a different new proceeding. In that case, it may be um, also interesting at the time frame until a decision at the patent court is at the moment 25 months, again, a bit more than two years. And um, I, I talked about that you may rely on additional documents. And there's also one important difference between uh, the nullity action and the um, opposition at the EPO. Because in the German court, you have additional prior art in form of national earlier rights. So earlier rights, these are pre-filed but post-published patent applications. And at the EPO, only pre-filed and post-published European patents will be considered. Whereas if you have, for example, a German patent which has been filed before your priority date of the patent, but has been published after, you can use that to attack the patent for novelty at the German uh, Federal Patent Court. You could not use such documents but, uh, at the European Patent Office, but you can use them at the German Federal Patent Court. So that's a very rough and a fast summary about the first instance decisions and proceedings at the Federal German Patent Court in nullity actions. Um, if you then have your first instance decision, the question is again, can you appeal? Well, you can. and. Um, you will end up at the Federal German High Court in Karlsruhe. So a very high instance, the last instance. And you need to file an appeal within one month of the notification of the contested decision. Again, you've got another two months to file your grounds. And again, you're only able to appeal the decision if you're adversely affected by the decision. And again, as it was with the EPO appeal, there is no reformatio in peus. So if you file an appeal and you're the only appellant, you cannot receive a result which puts you worse than at the first instance. Um, once you file your federal German high court appeal, um, the court will review it for admissibility and then summons for oral proceedings. And it may ask you for further statements, but it doesn't need to. Um, one more thing is, usually at, a, at the Federal German High Court, there are only a very limited number of attorneys at law allowed to represent. But patent attorneys in these cases are allowed to represent at the Federal German High Court. Um, however, 
it's highly advisable to also include an attorney at law in this stage because due to the procedural law, which can be rather complicated on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, these, uh, I think it's 100 patent, uh, attorneys at law who are allowed to represent at the federal high court, these know the court, the court knows these attorneys, and um, so the judges, um, well, it's a personal relationship, they know how to trust and they can trust the attorneys. Um, again, if, uh, as we have it in the first instance, new evidence, arguments, and requests may be rejected as late filed, and in principle, it's only a legal review of the first instance decision. Uh, that was changed also about eight years ago. Um, before that, we had large technical discussions be before the, um, well, the federal high court uh, in nullity actions. And um, that has been reduced um, in order to speed up the proceedings. However, um, a legal review means, it's quite interesting, legal inventiveness is uh, regarded to be a legal aspect. So the court may discuss inventiveness. And uh, for that reason, they uh, sometimes ca may call for a technical expert. In most cases, where uh, if it is a more complicated technical invention, they refer to a technical expert, which then gives an expertise uh, in the oral proceedings or even before uh, in a summon uh, or in a written statement. The decision, again, is taken uh, during oral proceedings. And the time frame, again, is two to four years. And again, we've got a decision on costs. The losing party bears the costs. And it's a high cost risk, again, depending on the value of the case. And the, the costs are more expensive than in the first instance. Um, there are, at the moment, around 60 new cases per year uh, at the Federal German High Court. So it's not as many as uh, in the first instance. And I think, of course, it's due to the cost risk and uh, many parties are, well, they're happy with the first instance decision and don't want to put themselves in economic risks again. So how's the situation in Japan, Yoshi-san? Uh, yes, so thank you, uh, Robert, for the explanation. Let's see, let's compare now with the procedure in Japan. Sumasan, could you please explain us the procedure as well as the reasons to invalidate and how to appeal a decision by the board? Thank you. Now, the, this is about the nullity action at the JPO. And the first the difference compared with the opposition at the JPO is that the only interest the interested party can file a nullity action. And this makes a big difference. You may remember that for oppositions, you can use a straw man. But for filing a nullity action, you must disclose your name and the confront, the patentee. And the, this means that this, the interest is a legal interest Therefore, it is high likely that the patentee assumes that you are infringing or is going to infringe in the future. Therefore, this will put you at our potential infringer position. So you must be aware of this. And the cost is uh, twice or three times as much as for an opposition. Then here you can see the cost for uh, official fees you have to pay to the JPO, which is the 300 euros for opposition and 700, 800 euros for nullity action. However, the actual cost is the attorney fees, which is uh, a lot higher than this official fee, but the attorney fee also is twice or three times higher for nullity actions than for oppositions. <clears throat> and it is because the, while the opposition is just a one blow of punch for the invalidation, and you file just one document and say this patent should be invalidated, and then the examination is in the hand of the patent office. However, in nullity action, so it is our inter-part proceedings. So you exchange opinions between the 
the filer of Mary Jackson and the patentee and back and forth. And almost at the end of the proceedings, you have oral hearing. Therefore, this is a kind of full menu, and this tends to be more expensive. But still, the decision can be expected within a year. And about the attorneyship, the Usually, uh, you do not use our attorney at law uh, for this. And uh, patent attorneys uh, can handle, and uh, in most of the cases, patent attorneys handle narrative actions. And with regard to the grounds for raising narrative action, almost the same as the opposition, because you can raise any reason for invalidity of the patent. And on top of that, you can question the ownership of the patent, that it is uh, similar to the situation in Europe. And <clears throat> in here, opposition, the Board of Appeal is bound by the reasons and arguments, and it cannot, cannot raise any additional reason by itself. So uh, the question is whether the, the filer of a uh, narrative action succeeded to prove to the satisfaction of the Board of Appeals that, that there is a good reason to invalidate the patent. And once a decision by the board of the JPO is given, uh, either party can appeal an unfavorable decision. <clears throat> and therefore, the, the, in opposition, only the patentee can file an, an appeal to IT High Court, but in narrative actions, either party, if this is dissatisfactory for the decision, can file an appeal to IT High Court. <clears throat> and statistically, uh, Nariki Action had a 60% success rate some time ago uh, in 2006. However, the success rate for the uh, Nariki Action has dropped gradually during 10 years. And in 2016, it was about 30%. So it has become more difficult to invalidate, even by the nullity actions. Thank you. So um, now could you please uh, summarize briefly the main differences between opposition and nullity actions which in each jurisdiction for each one of you, and also give us some recommendation on which one to choose, uh, which options to choose, like uh, military action or opposition. Thank you. Yes, so the comparison of opposition and military action uh, in Japan first. Uh, with regard to the term of filing, opposition has a limit, six months from publication of patent, while military action has no limit. Therefore, if you need more than six months to prepare argument or to prepare test data or anything, you cannot file an opposition and you should consider filing a nullity action. And especially this six months is short, I believe, for non-Japanese people because you must translate the granted patent and you must translate your argument into the Japanese language. And considering this time, six months is usually not enough. So uh, this works in an unfavorable way for non-Japanese entity, I'm afraid. And the second difference is eligibility for filing. The opposition can be filed by any third party and nullity action, for filing a nullity action, you need legal interest. Therefore, uh, the difference that I explained already, you can use straw man for opposition, but you must disclose your name for nullity action. 
And for the reason for reject, uh, reason for filing, are almost the same, but Nike Action has one more reason. It is the right of ownership. And with regard to the proceedings, the opposition is one blow by the opponent and the rest is given to the jurisdiction of the board. And uh, whereas the Nariki action is an inter -part proceedings, <coughs> so the opposition is more difficult to invalidate as the statistics tells. The success rate of opposition is about 12%, while the <coughs> success rate of the Nariki action is about 30%, so more than double. Although the success rate is not that high, there is a substantial difference. And proceedings is documentary for opposition, and narrative action is documentary plus oral examination, which is a crucial part. And with regard to a withdrawal, there is a difference you cannot withdraw your opposition after the Board of Appeal issues a notice of reason for revocation. And nullity action can be withdrawn any time before the finalization of the decision. The finalization of the decision means even if you receive a decision by the Board of Appeals, that is not yet finalized because you can file an appeal to IT High Court for which you have usually more than 30 days. And within these 30 days, you can withdraw your nullity action and everything will become indefinite. But in opposition, because uh, this, you cannot withdraw opposition after the issuance of a reason for revocation, it is difficult to use uh, opposition as a tool for negotiation. In negotiation, for example, you file an opposition or, no, sorry, not into action, and send a message that, uh, to the patentee that the patent could be invalidated and start negotiation for license at a lower fee, for example. The not action can be used in that way, but the opposition cannot. That is one big uh, difference. An official fee is like uh, written here, and which is not substantial anyway. The substantial part is the attorney fee. And with regard to the speed to come to a decision, you can expect the final decision about opposition within six months. In average, it's 5.8 months. And nullity action takes one year. Both are very fast compared with the other jurisdictions, but still uh, opposition is very quick. And as appeals, the, there is a limitation about the appeal for opposition decision, but for nullity action, you can always appeal to IP High Court. And could you explain uh, the summary in Europe? Yes, I will do. Um, as we learned, um, at, the term, at the EPO, we have centralized proceedings, whereas in validation actions, you have a plurality of national proceedings. At the EPO, each party bears its own costs, whereas in invalidation, uh, the losing party bears the costs, which can be quite expensive. EPO opposition is rather cheap. The official fees are about 785 euros, and you've got even the appeal fees uh, at the amount of 2,200 euros, whereas even at the uh, first instance, you may face court fees already in 20,000 euros. On the other hand, you have additional national earlier rights for invalidation proceedings, whereas at the EPO, you only have the EP earlier rights. One drawback, of course, as it's the same situation as in Japan, that an opposition can only be filed within nine months after grant, whereas the invalidation, there is no deadline for filing the court action. And what's also quite good, you can file an invalidation even if you lose your opposition. So it's possible in addition to the EP of opposition. 
again, it's a, a similar situation as in Japan. Um, the EPO opposition, even if you withdraw your opposition, the EPO may continue with the proceedings and render a decision. So if you uh, come to an agreement with the other party and you withdraw your opposition and there is a very good case at the EPO, the opposition division may revoke the patent anyways, whereas in invalidation proceedings at the Federal German Patent Court, if you withdraw the action, it's terminated. So as a conclusion, um, I think due to the first two, three points, um, EPO opposition seems to be advisable here. And uh, I think that's the, well, our advice, if you can file an EPO opposition, because you always have a second shot with nullity actions here. And um, I think, Yoshi, you have a, a current trend to consider with the JPO in this case again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, some thoughts, uh, some data about the statistics of opposition here is the statistics uh, taken from the opposition filed in 2015. And this is the year the new opposition system started. And there were 367 uh, oppositions filed. And for that, 362 decisions have already been made. Therefore, uh, almost all of them have decided. And the conclusion is that 46 patents were revoked, which means 12.7% were revoked. Whereas the 167 patents were maintained and four requests for opposition was withdrawn and one is still pending. So it tells that the, if you look at the number of revoked patents, it is 12.7%. Therefore, as a tool to invalidate a patent, this is not that strong. This might be the, the result of the pro, recent pro-patent trend at the JPO. And if you compare this 12.7% with the success rate of Nariki Action, as I stated before, Nariki Action is successful in 30% of the cases. So clearly, Nariki Action are more successful than oppositions. However, there is a little more detailed analysis about what happened. In the decisions to maintain a patent, the claims were amended in 51.3% of the cases, which is 50% of the cases. So if the target of filing an opposition is to make the patentee amend the claims, you can say that was successful for more than half of the cases. However, there is something you should consider. That is, the opponent files its opposition, uh, opposition and opinion to invalidate the patent, but the examination after that is in the hand of the Board of Appeals of the JPO. And the JPO and the patentee exchange opinions and even makes uh, oral um, face-to-face um, -face meeting with the examiner. And therefore, how to amend the claims are totally in the hands of the JPO and the patentee. The opponent cannot control the amendments other than the first blow, or once the amendment is made, opponent can file one opinion against the amendment. But that's all about the contribution of the opponent. Therefore, the opponent cannot directly influence or control the amendments of the claims. So considering that the 51.3% of the amendments may not be always a success for the opposition, but the, this is the statistics. And 
uh, whether you think this is a successful result or not enough, it will depend on the situation. Some words about the strategic choice at the JPO uh, between opposition and narrative actions. So given all the limitations and the characteristics of oppositions and knowledge actions, the, we believe that the, the opposition is advantageous if the interest is to lower the cost and to speed up because you can get the conclusion within six months. And the anonymity is important. When one of these three are very important, it, is a, it would be a good choice to fight an opposition. In contrast, the, you should go to nullity action if the invalidation of the patent is the utmost importance or six months is too short. And, or you have to raise a question about ownership of the invention or if you are going to use uh, this tool as a tool for negotiation for license. In these situations, you should consider or rather choose narrative action rather than opposition. That is our advice. Could you comment a little about the unitary patents? Uh, sorry, I should proceed. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. Yes, please, Robert, please comment on the on the situation in Europe, whether or not it's going to change with the unitary patent. Well, um, one of the main aspects in introducing the unitary patent system was that, uh, as I said before, after grant of the EPO patent, it splits up in national patents, uh, and that's supposed to change. Um, there will be an invalidation action for a unitary patent as a whole, uh, and that will need to be filed at the central division of the Unified Patent Court. And uh, so you have, again, centralized proceedings, and one decision will uh, be relevant for the full territorial scope of the unitary patent. Another advantage, maybe, is that the language of the proceeding is the language of the patent. So if you've got an English, English patent, um, you don't need to uh, have all your proceedings in German, for example. There are some translation issues, but not in this context. Um, there will be a very strict time frame. Um, at the moment, the plan is to render a first instance decision in 12 to 15 months. Uh, this sounds very advantageous, but you have a very high court fees and you have a high cost risk. Again, this is based on the value of the case, and the problem is, um, uh, in an average value of a case here in a German nullity action, uh, it starts at 750,000 euros. And if you calculate that a unitary patent will cover 10, 15, 20 uh, jurisdictions, the, the value of the case, in my point, uh, in my opinion, will be at least three to five millions. And then you can have a reimbursable costs which may exceed 200,000 euros for your patent. If, you, if, if you're a patent owner and you lose your patent, you may be forced to pay the other party 200,000 euros, which is a lot of cost risk. And again, you have an appeal which is possible for uh, these invalidation proceedings at the unitary patent. And another thing which is, I think, at the beginning, a disadvantage, you don't have any case law at the moment, so you're walking into unknown territory. You don't know how the judges will decide on uh, inventiveness and on, uh, well, um, added subject matter and things like that. So there are some advantages, but also disadvantages with the new system. But the question is, how, where are we at that UPC and the unitary patent at the moment? It has been promised for the last 40 years. We were very close uh, in getting it started, and then uh, we had some issues with Brexit. At the moment, we've got a court action pending against the unitary patent uh, system and court system at the German Constitutional Court. And that's why Germany at the moment stopped the ratification. 
and uh, the German Constitutional Court, they plan to have a hearing and a decision rendered in this matter uh, during this year, which, well, is quite interestingly, but we don't know when this will be. So as I said, the decision is expected this year. And if the decision is positive, so that the uh, unitary patent court system does not violate the German Constitution, then we may in fact see a very fast ratification by Germany. And you know, this slide is already outdated because the United Kingdom ratified yesterday. So at the moment, the eyes are on Germany and whether the German Constitutional Court decides in favor or against the unitary patent force. Uh, patent system. If it is in favor, the system will enter into force within months. However, we don't know what will be the effect of Brexit. Some people say London, uh, the UK cannot stay within the agreement. Some say it can stay in the agreement. We'll have to wait and see. And there are even rumors about uh, the German Constitutional Court, they will extend the proceedings until the effect of Brexit is there in order to have at least not a situation before Brexit which may lead to a lot of problems afterwards. So I think with respect to oppositions and nullity actions, we may expect that it will be easier to have a nullity proceedings against a granted European patent after the system comes into force but it's also got its uh, disadvantages. And I think that's all for the moment. Thank you for staying with us so long. I know uh, we took longer than expected, and uh, I hope that we still have some time for the uh, question and answer sec section, and I think that's um, Luca to decide. Thank you for your well, audience. Well, thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. So let's uh, proceed now to the question and answer. We have uh, one question already in the chat, so you can uh, feel free to uh, write down your question on the chat on the right hand um, of your computer. Uh, one question for Sonora from Mr. Moran Ludwig. Can the opponent introduce new reasons for opposition anytime? Is no is the answer to the question because <clears throat> the, in the opposition, the opponent can file uh, its opinion at the beginning of the opposition proceedings. And that's all except when the patent claims are amended by the patentee, wherein the opponent can have the second chance to uh, submit its opinion. But the second opinion must be directed to the amended claims only. Therefore, I have to say that there is one blow and there is no second chance. Did it answer the question? I believe so. Um, we'll have a look in a moment. So um, another question. Uh, from Mr. Bedenbecker. For those um, who are interested in the future development of the EPO uh, in the activities, you may want to check for the user consultation on the re revision of the rules of procedure of the board of appeal. Um, Robert, do you have any comment on this comment? Well, I think it's a good point. As I said, the rules of procedure are now under discussion and there are some quite important uh, changes coming up. Um, as I said, uh, only a legal review of the first instance decision. Another point is that the Board of Appeals may render a decision without delivering grounds for that if the parties agree or under special circumstances. So you will only receive the minutes of the decision. So I think it's a really good comment by Mr. Biedenbecker and I really, um, I also can ask everybody to have a look at all these uh, developments and to see the uh, consultations. As more uh, stakeholders uh, put in their comments, the better the outcome will be for us in the end. Thank you. And another uh, question to Sonodasa from Ms. de Chateau-Thierry. 
are prior uses possible grounds for opposition before the Japan Patent Office, and which level of proof uh, would be required? Uh, yes, uh, that can be a reason for opposition or uh, not to action for both of them. Uh, however, uh, I have to remind that if there is a patent application filed in the JPO prior to the, the patent application in question and published after that, then you can use this as a reason for opposition or not to action. The prior application in other jurisdictions will not work in the same way. You cannot use uh, the prior application in EPO or in the U.S. Another question, is it better to patent in German or English? From Mr. Schneider, I believe that this is uh, directed to Robert. Well, um, is it better to patent in German or in English? It's a, it's a very good question. I think um, translations are always problematic, but if you um, intend to use your patent afterwards, not only in Germany or at the EPO, but also in other countries like Australia or the US, it may indeed um, be a very good ad advice to already draft and file the application in English at the uh, European Patent Office. And uh, the good thing, even if you file it in Germany, um, the German Patent Office now offers 12 months before you have to hand in a translation. So if you draft in English and you hand it in at the German Patent Office, um, you will have your first search results or even your first preliminary um, examination results before you have to decide whether or not to file a translation. Um, so I'd say if your main aspect is not only Germany, but if you want to file at the EPO anyways and in other countries, it seems advisable to use English. Now, could I comment about the language in the Japanese jurisdiction? Uh, when you file a patent application through Paris route, you have two choices, whether to file uh, in the Japanese language from the beginning or to file it in any language, in English or German or French or any language, and file a Japanese translation of uh, the original filed application within four months. And we recommend that you follow the second route, which is to file in the original language and then file translation. The reason is when there is a problem of translation uh, found later, if you file the original language and the, then the Japanese translation, if you did that, you can always go back to the original language and correct the translation problem. So that can be a huge advantage sometimes. Well, thank you very much. We'll accept the last question um, and wrap up things. So um, thank you for your answer about prior use before the GPO. Um, so Ms. Chateau, Dr. chateau Thierry, I have a second question about the level of proof compared to the EPO practice, which is beyond reasonable doubt. What about uh, the practice in Japan? Uh, the, uh, this is about uh, the JPO and uh, for the prior right. And therefore, uh, the reason for revocation uh, by filing opposition or not action must be based on the patent application filed in the JPO. Therefore, the J as for the evidence, it is clear. You have a prior application and the patent in question. And in this situation, the, what you can do is to attack the, the novelty of the patent. The patent in question cannot use it to attack the inventive step. Therefore, you cannot combine 
two applications. As far as the, the patent in question is disclosed somewhere in the, in the application or drawing of the prior application, then you can invalidate the, the, the patent. Thank you very much, Tomasa, for your answer. Thank you uh, to all the audience. I will let Luca uh, have a conclusion on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane, and uh, thank you, uh, Sanoda san and Robert. You have been amazingly uh, good at uh, explaining, giving us uh, more than a, <laughs> an idea about the, uh, the today's topic, uh, I think that everybody was really, really uh, happy to hear what you you had to say. We we set a new record for the webinar. We have been glued for 90 minutes, so uh, congrats for that. And uh, all of the participants stayed with us, uh, so I'm very happy to report that as well. Uh, just to give any information to the to the to our audience, the materials will be uploaded. Uh, we will have also the uh, the webinar, the video of the webinar uploaded on our YouTube channel, so you will be able to rewatch it or share it with uh, with friends and colleagues. So please do it. Uh, again, I would like to to thank our speakers uh, of today and and of course all the audience, and also remind that uh, at the end of May, May thirty first, we have the next webinar, webinar number nineteen. It will be on innovation and uh, how to build an IT portfolio, especially for startups with a speaker from Palo Alto, so the timing will be a little bit different. It will be afternoon in Europe. So without further ado, thanks again uh, to everyone, and uh, I'll see you soon, and have a great weekend.